So when approaching a business rescue, most of the time the root cause of the distress is mismanagement. When replacing a board, sometimes the BRP needs to resort to a legal process when and declare a director delinquent. We are catching up with Jessica Osmond, who is an associate at Cliff Decker Hofmeyer, to discuss the process behind this. Um, Jessica, let's start at the beginning. What does it mean when a director is declared delinquent? Hmm, thanks, Jonathan. So, so, yeah, I think I think the beginning is a is a good place to start. And for purposes of this discussion, I think I think it's very good to have an under, understanding of exactly what it means um, to be declared um, delinquent, like as as a director. Um, you know, the term of late has been thrown around in the media quite often. And but I think I think the average man on the street doesn't actually know what exactly it entails and the actual effects of, of such an order. And so in understanding the term better, I think it's important for one to have consideration um, for Section 1625 of the Companies Act, which actually specifically provides um, for this declaration of a delinquent director in various circumstances. Obviously, these circumstances are provided for in the Act, and we, you know, we've had case law, you know, recent case law kind of grappling with what those circumstances are and i mean I'll, I'll get into that a little later but i suppose it yeah it's it's, it's in terms of you know meeting that meeting that threshold is establishing those circumstances and then and bringing the necessary order in accordance with the act and you know the effect of such an order i think is is far more severe than you know i think we, we're very used to the removal of directors from a company or from a board you know board of directors but you know, deeming or declaring somebody a delinquent director um, is, is a far more severe sanction. And so this ultimately actually disqualifies someone from then being able to act as a director of a company. Um, and the, the, the sanction may subsist unconditionally um, for a lifetime or, you know, even even so the minimum, the minimum sanction is also quite severe in that it's, it's seven, a minimum of seven years. Um, and so the duration and the sanction, um, the duration of the sanction and the conditions linked to that may vary, um, and that's that's to the to the court's discretion. But um, yeah, I mean that's decided on a case by case basis. But um, the court, you know, yeah, you would definitely need to 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 prove those circumstances, and and the court the court would have to make that decision. You mentioned um, you know a specific section within the Companies Act. So what needs to take place in order for a director to be declared delinquent? What kind of mismanagement needs to occur? Um, can you provide some examples? Is there a specific test? Mm. So yeah. So first thing to note, which is interesting in the Act, and as I said, it, the Act is is quite good at you know it sets it sets it out. But what is difficult is then it's one thing on paper, it's another thing in real life, and so starting at the beginning, starting at the wording of the Act, Section 1625, it imposes a peremptory obligation actually on the courts um, to declare a director delinquent in certain circumstances. And so ju by judging, uh, judging the wording of the section, it's actually interesting that if the grounds of delinquency are established in terms of the Act, the court actually must then grant this order. And it has no discretion as to whether or not it should or shouldn't. Yes, it has discretion in terms of the sanction to impose and 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 you know any any other conditions that will go along with that sanction. But um, yeah, it is it is the court is actually obliged to make such an order. Um, and so specifically, section one six two five, and and I'll paraphrase, but it includes the circumstances, you know, which I'll list. But you know, it's not limited to that. But instances where a, a director has grossly abused his or her position as a director or where him or her where he or he or she has taken personal advantage of information um you know privy to him or her by virtue of their position as a director um where they've used that information and, and taken an opportunity to gain an advantage for another person or another company for, for whose whose board they do not serve or, or knowingly causing harm to the company or subsidiary of the company you've also got the consideration where it, you know in the instance where a director intentionally or by gross negligence um, inflicts harm upon the company or a subsidiary thereof um, or simply acts in a manner that amounts to gross negligence um, willful misconduct or a breach of trust in relation to the performance 
of the director's functions and duties within the company. And I think in, in considering, because as I said, it's one thing on paper, it's another thing in real life, and thankfully that's how we have case law. And, you know, I think a practical example of this was we look at the one of the very first cases, um, which was the Kukama versus Lobelo case. Um, in this matter, Kukama had applied to the court um, that for the first respondent to then be declared a delinquent director and for his removal um, on the grounds that Kukama had averred that Lobelo had engaged in reckless trading. Um, he'd, you know, he'd used his position as a director well as information acquired as a director to gain personal advantage. And I can go on and on and on as to, you know, what he tried to prove in terms of the act. But the basis of this was, was that what had happened was SARS had paid out monies to the company based on fictitious invoices that were submitted to SARS. This was in the amount of 39 million. And the bottom line, basically the grounds upon which, you know, they, they premised this, this application was that Lobelo's failure to detect the fraud of the 39 million and then the failure thereafter to then pay the monies back to SARS once, you know, once it had been determined um, was basically found to be to, to amount to willful misconduct and or, you know, a breach of trust as envisaged in terms of the section. And the court in that instance, uh, you know, felt that Lobelo's conduct had had fell short of the standard expected of a director of the company to such an extent that it amounts to willful misconduct, breach of trust, and basically a gross abuse of position as a director. And I think in in you know more recent example we we've got uh, Ms. Nyeni um, of SAA where yeah where the court did not take lightly um, to the conduct that was presented before it, and yeah I mean where she it was alleged that she unjustifiably caused for the demise of a lucrative deal between SAA and Emirates and, you know, in amongst other, amongst other deals. Um, but yeah, just in considering SAA's position and her, her obligation as a director to act in the best interest of the company, um, the, court, the court did not take lightly to the fact that, well, found that she acted neither in the best interest of the company and her conduct was neither indicative um of you know reasonable care and skill and so yeah i mean there are there are tests and and you know i'll, I'll talk about that later but it's it's just determining mm. that sort of conduct i mean you mentioned the didu miyeni case and i mean it was very significant in the context of brps the industry and the media attention that business rescue has received over the last two years um can her actions be seen as the benchmark against which future sort of cases of delinquency is going to be used to declare a few future directors delinquent? So, I mean, I wouldn't say it's the benchmark purely because we've had we've had this this Kukama case previously, which kind of was the first case um, that kind of set set the tone, set the scene. And then we've also actually had, which the Mnieni case referred to, which is the Gehwala case. Um, and in that case, it actually spoke to, you know, what, you know, what is, um, what are the circumstances that upon which you can bring such a, just such an order. And in that case, in the Gehwala case, it spoke about establishing the circumstances um, surrounding which such an order would be, would be viable. And the court in that instance stated that you had to consider whether the conduct constituted serious misconduct. And in, in, in considering what serious misconduct would entail, it didn't, the court went on to state that it, that it involved a person who grossly abuses his or her position of directorship. And it's equivalent to recklessness. Um, it was confirmed that recklessness <laughs> and gross negligence involve a complete obtuseness, obtuseness of mind um, or a total failure to take care and an entire failure to give any consideration to the consequences of one's actions, whether, whether both foreseen and unforeseen. And so I think in that instance, I think that was sort of the benchmark in terms of, you know, from a practical perspective or, you know, an ob it, it kind of gave us an objective in a very subjective test as to what the threshold is. But I definitely do think that this Mnieni case is important in that we don't see very many of these 
these applications made to de to declare a, a director delinquent. And I think this has just been a very, very good reminder that companies and, and interested parties do have this mechanism at their disposal, that it's very important that, you know, that directors are aware of their obligations um, towards a company and that they take the necessary care as expected by or from a reasonable, you know, a reasonable professional person. Um, you know, Mnieni was found to have completely betrayed the trust placed in her as a director. Um, she professed herself to be to be an expert on corporate governance, which I think, you know, then the court, you know, didn't take very lightly and, and you know, said, you know, you've 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 portrayed to to have this level of, of care and this level of expertise, yet you've acted in such a manner. So the court does, you know, take all of that into consideration. And so, so yeah, so whilst whilst I don't know if it's it's quite the benchmark, definitely in the modern era, I think it's woken us all up to, to those sort of circumstances and and the the threshold that needs to be met if if one is to bring such an application. Yeah, I think the role of directors is very important. I mean, even the Independent Board of Directors of Southern Africa wrote to the Zondo Commission of Inquiry recently saying or pointing out the role of uh, directors play in building a strong South African company and urging the Zondo Commission to um, talk to other branches of sort of government and legal government to put in more stringent legal sort of steps such as King 4 and accepting other things mm. in order to strengthen the profession. Um, so Mieni was declared a delinquent director for life. You know, what does that mean? And I mean, it leads into my next question. Okay, so yes, so as, as I mentioned previously, the courts kind of have this discretion as to whether or based on, on a case by case basis, what, you know, how long the sanction will subsist. So as I mentioned, the minimum, the minimum um, sanction to be, you know, imposed should should an order be granted to declare um, a director delinquent. Um, that is for a seven year sanction, seven year period. But in Amyeni's case, we saw the court, as I, and as I mentioned, the court did not take lightly to to mm. the evidence for it, and it actually declared Mieni a delinquent director for life. Um, and so, what this means is that she is basically disqualified, um, and she's she's not eligible to serve as a director um, of a company for the duration of her life. And whilst you know she may apply, she may apply to court to have to have the sanction lifted or relaxed. She may only do so after three years, and even so, given the severity of the lifetime sanction, um, I do think it would be very, very difficult for her to get that relaxed. Um, but even so, I mean, she would have to prove, you know, the circumstances upon which she brings such an application and, and whether it's warranted. And even so, even if the court does entertain such a thing, um, the court more often than not places a places a director that has been deemed a delinquent. Um, under probation, and so there's there are many hurdles still still to go through. But yeah, that in effect um, is is the the consequence of that of that order. Now, while she was the director at SAA, she was a director of a number of other companies at the same time. Does the delinquent does the delinquency order from the SAA case apply to all the other companies that she is the, the director of? Or is it a case of, well, you'd have to prove that she was delinquent in each and every one of those other companies as well? No. So, so this is, so I think this is why the threshold and the burden of proof in this, in this instance is so high because the declaration of a, you know, declaring a, a director delinquent has way more far reaching effects than that of a, an order removing a director from a board of directors of a company. So this, uh, it, this, this declaration or this sanction, um, it spans over and it disqualifies a person from then acting as a director on any board of any company. Um, and even in the instance where, you know, maybe a board of directors is none the wiser and a person who has then been declared a delinquent or a delinquent director, um, then you know accepts an offer to serve as a director or acts in, in a capacity as a director or prescribed officer an interested person or you know a person in terms of the act can then bring an application once again declaring the person a, de a delinquent director because they are disqualified from acting in such an office and uh, yeah as i said i don't think the court I don't th yeah i think for repeat offenders the court may you know may impose in a more severe sanction in terms of um time time frames and timelines 
but yeah, it, it does it it applies then across across the board. In the interest of wrapping up, Jessica, maybe let's focus on if a BRP has got a situation where there has been mismanagement at a company and they have to, as a last resort, consider declaring the director delinquent because they're digging in the heels and they don't want to leave. What are the important legal aspects that BRPs need to remember when approaching legal counsel to get such an order put in place? So, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I mean, we haven't come across many of these, many cases where, if any, I mean, I personally haven't ever seen where a business rescue practitioner has brought this an order um, to declare a director delinquent. You know, they'll normally go the route of applying for the removal of a director in terms of the act. But, yeah, for purposes of this discussion, I think with, you know, with the Mieni case, bringing it to light, we may see more and more going forward. And I think, if a BRP was to consider bringing such an application, I think it would be important for the BRP to firstly consider and determine locus standi. I think um, you know it, it's provided for in the Act, and then secondly to ensure that you know the circumstances that you allege or the misconduct that you allege that you have enough evidence and enough proof to meet that burden of proof to show willful and gross misconduct, to show recklessness. Um, and to show you know a flagrant or you know disregard of of a director's duties and and the the duties imposed on them in terms of the act and so yeah i mean in terms of section you know section 161622 it provides you know for the people who can bring bring such a such a such an application and then it goes hand in hand with section 1375 which then talks about you know business rescue practitioners right to bring an application for the removal of a director and then within that section the subsection six um you know states that over and above the subsection five um the the business rescue practitioner any right of a person to apply to court for an order contemplated in section 162 is also then afforded to a business rescue practitioner and so yeah I, th I think the most important thing is just gathering gathering sufficient evidence um ensuring that you have a proper case to meet the high threshold, the burden of proof that's expected. And I think, yeah, I think it would then be for the court to determine whether you've met, met those circumstances.